Egyptian mummification, one of the oldest religious rituals in human history and the most complex and impressive ever. The ancient Egyptians mummified their dead because they believed that the physical body would be important in the next life. Thus, the goal of mummification was to preserve the body in as lifelike a way as possible and keep it intact so it could be transported to a spiritual afterlife. Today, the world's museums are teeming with Egyptian mummies. To some extent, they are treated with the respect and appreciation that the ancient Egyptians wanted. At least no one can harm them, and the fascinated visitors come specially to glorify them. But hundreds of years ago, Egyptian mummies were treated with unspeakable brutality. When Europe was marred in ignorance and backwardness, Europeans committed heinous acts against Egyptian mummies, acts that amount to not only crimes against humanity, but also crimes against history. The story began at the end of the 15th century and the beginning of the 16th century with the collapse of the Mamluk Sultanate in Egypt, during which the country was a major regional power and continued as such until the Ottoman invasion of Egypt in 1517, which plunged the country into long ages of cumberly darkness. The Ottoman Empire didn't care about the regions far from its center in Anadolia, so the Egyptian people plunged into poverty and ignorance, and the country became a fertile environment for the antiquities trade. The greedy European antiquities dealers that missed the opportunity and began to flock to Egypt to make gains. In particular, the mummies trade flourished in the country. The smuggling of antiquities and mummies continued at the hands of European traders and their agents in Egypt throughout the period of the Ottoman occupation until the advent of the French campaign in Egypt, which sparked the European obsession with the country. Smuggling and theft continued over the following years after the withdrawal of the French campaign from Egypt and the decline of the authority of the Ottoman governors. Then, during the rule of Muhammad Ali dynasty, until the British occupation of Egypt in 1882, which lasted for nearly 74 years, during which the Egyptians resisted by all means until their struggle was crowned with success. When the last British soldier left Egypt in 1956, after the independence revolution in 1952. Over all these years, the Europeans treated the mummies smuggled to their countries inappropriately and committed heinous practices against them. In the 15th century, Europeans believed the bitumen possessed miraculous healing powers. The black, sticky and viscous substance which we use today in bathing roads and streets, was known in Persian as mumia. A misunderstanding caused by ignorance occurred when Europeans discovered Egyptian mummies. They called them mummy, thinking they contained the Persian mumia or bitumen. Because of the blackened appearance of some of the bodies, which was through the aging of the embalming materials, and from here. The disaster began. As a result of the lack of bitumen in its natural form, Europeans rushed to buy and eat Egyptian mummies greedily, 
considering as an abundant and available alternative source. Enterprising merchants went hunting in Egyptian tombs for more supplies. In 1586, English merchant John Sanderson smuggled 600 pounds of mummy parts from an Egyptian tomb. We were let down by ropes, as into a well, with wax candles burning in our hands, and so walked upon the bodies of all sorts and sizes, some great and small, they have no noisome smell at all being broken, for I broke off all the parts of the bodies to see how the flesh was turned to drag, and brought home divers head, hands, arms and feet for a show. We brought also 600 pounds, together with the whole body. Mummies were widely stuck in European apothecaries where it could be purchased in several forms including powdered and chopped preparations. They were used to treat illnesses from headaches to reducing swelling or curing the plague. The English physician and philosopher Thomas Brown wrote, Mummy is become merchandise. Mizraim cures wounds and Pharaoh is sold for balsams. European royal and social elite were also particularly obsessed with mummies. They were used in the English court of Edward IV. Francis I of France was reported to never go anywhere without some mummy combined with rhubarb. Catherine de Medici, Queen of France from 1547 until 1559 sent her chaplain to Egypt in 1549 to procure some. English philosopher and statesman and the first recipient of the Queen's Council designation, Francis Bacon, wrote, Mummy has great force in a stunching of blood. Not everyone believed in the healing powers of powdered mummy. However, as early as 1582, the French surgeon Ambroise Barry wrote in his Discours de la Mumie. The effect of this malevolent drug is such that not only does it do nothing whatsoever to improve patients, as I have seen for myself on numerous occasions among those forced to take it, but it also causes them terrible stomach pains, a foul smell in the mouth, and great vomiting. So, by the 18th century, complaints were widespread, and doctors were prescribing less, and fewer apothecaries were stuck in it. The use of mumia did already decline because cannibalism caused people misgivings. It stopped because doctors and druggists doubted that it had any medicinal value. But the distraction of mummies didn't stop there. Europeans used ground and mummies as medicine, but they also used them in art. From at least the 16th century, a pigment called mummy brown was made from the smuggled Egyptian mummies and appeared on the palettes of European artists. To mix the pigment, grown up ancient bodies were mixed with bitumen and myrrh. Historical records date Mummy Brown's early use to the Renaissance. Painters were set to prize Mummy Brown for its richness and versatility. They often used it for shading, chiaroscuro, and flesh tones. From the 16th century to the 19th century, many painters favored the pigment, and it remained available into the 20th century, even as supplies dwindled. In 1915, a London pigment dealer commented 
that one mummy would produce enough begmen to last him and his customers 20 years. In 1712, an artist supply shop called Alamumi opened in Paris, selling paints and varnish as well as powdered mummy, incense and myrrh. The pigment achieved its greatest popularity in the mid 18th to 19th centuries. In 1849, was described as being quite in vogue. It was, for example, one of the pigments on the palette of Delacroix in 1854. When painting the Salon de la Bay at the Hotel de Ville, the British portraitist Sir William Beechey was also recorded as having stocks of it. Too, it was being used by the Brie Raphaelite Edward Pern Jones in 1881, and most likely by Alma Tadema and other colleagues. The French artist Martin Rowling also reputedly used Mummy Brown. It has been suggested that his L'Interieur d'une Cuisine or interior of a kitchen is an example of extensive use of the pigment. To be fair, not everyone knew what they were painting with. When artist Edward Byrne Jones found out, he held a little funeral for a tube of paint in his back garden. Byrne Jones' action was symptomatic of the growing distaste surrounding the whole idea of Mummy Brown. Partly out of increasing awareness of its grisly origins and the increasing respect for mummy's scientific, archaeological, and cultural importance, added to the significant reduction in the number of mummies available, usage of the pigment fell away dramatically in the early 20th century. But in conjunction with the decline of mummy brand, another terrible practice began to spread. By the 18th century, European attitude toward mummies was shifting. People began to be more interested in what lay under the winding sheets of a mummy's wrapping. Unwrapping a mummy would become an event one that could be hosted in a private home, or later, in a public theater. The first recorded account of a mummy and rabbit occurred in 1698. Bruno de Maillet, the French consul in Cairo, was the first European to delve beneath the bindings and take extensive notes. In the early 18th century, Christian Herzog Pathakari to the Duke of Saxe Coburg and wrapped the mummy in front of an audience. He published his findings in his book Mumiagraphia. The public study of mummies continued and reached a new peak in the early 19th century, when the Napoleonic Wars and English colonialism were stirring up new interest in ancient Egypt. Throughout the century, as mummies were sold profusely in the streets of Egypt by street vendors, public mummy and wrappings were highly popular events in England. The man who pioneered this was a circus performer turned antiquity salesman named Giovanni Belzoni. Belzoni made a name for himself in Egypt obsessed circles. After arranging for the removal of several massive Egyptian artifacts on behalf of British consul to Egypt, Henry Salt. In 1821, he held the public mummy and wrapping as part of an exhibition of Egyptian antiquities near Piccadilly Circus. The event proved an enormous success. Over 2,000 people attended on opening day alone. One member of the audience was London surgeon and scholar Thomas Bittegrow, who became known later in life as Mummy Bittegrow. He was so enamored of the spectacle that he began holding his own public ticket and unrollings. 
and the time, Beta Girls public exhibitions of mummies were widely popular. Some historians claim that mummy unwrapping became a popular form of Victorian parlor entertainment. At the general public, specifically members of the upper class could purchase tickets to dramatized unwrapping performances held in theaters, after which the discarded cloth wrapping served as take-home favors. For example, so states this invitation sent by Lord Landisporo for June 10, 1850. The nobleman organized this event at his London residence, officiated by Samuel Birch, keeper of Oriental antiquities at the British Museum. Birch had no medical training, so he gave few details concerning the physical condition of the mummy and those attending the event watched with delight as a copy of the Book of the Dead, and various beautiful amulets bear them at the wrappings. By the late 20th century, with the rise of the digital and information revolution and decolonization, all the aforementioned atrocities here are being practiced against Egyptian mummies had come to an end. Of course, the great role of Europeans in developing Egyptology and saving Egyptian temples and monuments during the subsequent years can be denied. So, this documentary is not to criticize or demonize a particular race or nationality, but rather to shed light on how humans can, through a mixture of stupidity and ignorance, irreversibly destroy an extremely important part of human heritage an irreplaceable and priceless port.